Daily Bread drive through. We're here. We are here. We're in Proverbs. I'm excited. I um I'm excited. It says in the word that when Jonathan, the son of Saul, had put the honey to his mouth, it says his eyes were lightened. Um, I'm just excited that although by God's grace I'm a teacher of the word. I'm still at the end of the day, just a redeemed sinner, a trophy of his grace, who's also seeking to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord. I'm still one commanded to get his own daily bread and I'm getting rocked. So I'm excited. If you see me excited today, it's because what I studied blessed me. Um, Remember Proverbs comes from two Latin words, pro and werbum or verbum, there's really no V in Latin. So you pronounce a V as a W, most don't know that. So pro werbum, it means pro in front of, werbum or verbum, a set of words. It means to put an encapsulated pithy set of words in front of you, to put a saying in front of you that gives you wisdom, that uh, is worth a thousand words, a thousand images that gives you instruction for life. That's what a proverb is. It is a wise saying put in front of you in a pithy um, set of words, easy to remember, easy to pass on to your kids. Um, that's the next question, you know. How are you with raising your kids? How are you with teaching your kids the word? Um, I want to share something in humility, but I felt God really put this on my heart. Um, You can want the world for your kids, but if this is not real to you, it's not going to be real for your kids. If church is not exciting for you, don't be excited. Don't be uh, surprised when it's not exciting for your kids. If you don't learn uh, from your pastor uh, and you know it all, don't be surprised when you have kids that are like, what's the point of learning from a pastor? I got commentaries too. Uh, It's one thing to want the world for your kids, but more is caught than taught. Uh, They need to see your excitement in the word. And let me tell you, and I don't mean to scare those of you that have little babies, raising them when before they're 10, cakewalk. When they are older, worldviews, worldviews sneaking up on them, they don't even realize that their worldview is being challenged. All of the different things, music, culture, um, all the ideologies, and you having to disciple that, having to teach them not just the knowledge of the word, but how to apply the word in life. Parents, get ready now. Get ready now, because before you know it, you'll just be a nominal believer going to church on Sundays, um, and then Sunday, everyone puts on Christianity, and then when they call you, when their flesh is flared up, when they're confused, when they're frustrated, when they're stressed, um, and you will not have a word for them, nor will you have the prophetic insight to actually apply the word and give them the proverb they need, because that's what it's all about. So let's, for the sake of everyone we love, for the sake of everyone around us, we have no other choice but to get deep in the word. Oh, you're making money. That's phenomenal. But how's your relationship with the word? Oh, man, God is opening doors in your life. Yo, I'm going to be your number one cheerleader. But yo, how's your relationship with the word? Everything rises and falls on our relationship with the word. Um, And when we stand before Christ, it's going to all be according to his word. So that being said, let's go to Proverbs 12, 1. It says, who loves instruction loves knowledge, uh, but he that hates correction is brutish. In the NIV, it actually says, who hates correction is stupid. Oh, wow. Now we know that even since you, when you were a kid, I mean, before curse words were like floating around and even after curse words were floating around, stupid was like the word that just stung. You remember the first time you were called stupid? Um, I mean, just to even pull it out of the hat today, when you hear it, your ears just bend when you hear anyone use the word stupid, because it's just the word. That's what it means here. It says here, who loves instruction loves knowledge. The person who loves being corrected, who loves being challenged, loves knowledge, but he that hates correction is stupid. Dang. Is it safe to say that we live in a day where a lot of Christians are stupid? Because the minute you challenge them, man, they disappear. You can almost predict it like, yo, this person got challenged. 
Well, usually it's when someone starts walking off into the night. Yo, do we love correction? Um, a wise person, a person that loves instruction will love, love, love uh, being corrected. Here's a great quote I want to read. Um, and again, this is encouraging. Let it encourage you. Um, when it says here, who loves instruction loves knowledge, but he that hates reproof is brutish. I want to read this, uh, and this is what it says. A necessary condition of learning is having a teachable spirit, the desire to learn. Those who love knowledge are willing, even eager to be corrected. Let me read that again. Based on Proverbs 12, 1, those who love knowledge, if you love knowledge, you love the knowledge of God, you want the right way, you know, you're doing that math equation, but you want to have the right answer. When you love knowledge, you are willing, even eager to be corrected since they know that learning has at least two aspects. So it's saying any person who loves learning, any person who loves knowledge knows that knowledge has two aspects. What are they? Gaining new material and having wrong information. Anyone who loves learning knows that there are going to be two variables at play. Gaining new material and having wrong information. Gaining new material. Aha, I never knew that. And having wrong information. Wow, I thought I was thinking right, acting right, doing right blind spot, I've got wrong information. It says here, gaining new material and having wrong information, interpretations or practices. Um, so basically, it's gaining new material and it's having wrong information, wrong interpretations, and wrong practices corrected. So those are actually just like my body has two arms, the two arms of of, of learning, Proverbs 12, 1 says, whoever loves instruction, loves knowledge, the two arms of one who loves learning. People say, oh man, I, I love learning. I love learning. Uh, you know, I watch nothing but the History Channel and that geo, uh, and I have biblical archaeology uh, subscription uh, and all types of stuff. Well, it says that anyone that truly loves knowledge understands that it has two arms, gaining new material and having wrong information wrong interpretations or wrong practices corrected. How are you in having your wrong practices corrected? How are you in having your wrong interpretations corrected? I see people that, man, they feel the Bible can be interpreted this way. Someone disagrees with their view or their interpretation and they're all red in the face and all, yo, how are you with having wrong practices corrected? How are you with having wrong interpretations corrected? How are you with having wrong information corrected. Whoever despises correction, however, is little better than a brute since their attitude renders them unwilling and unable to learn. It also makes them vulnerable since they can't benefit from the wisdom of others. Do you benefit from the wisdom of others? How much do you seek the wisdom of others? Uh, even though I'm a pastor, even though I'm the founder and a lead pastor of a church, uh, I still love seeking the wisdom of those who've been pastoring longer than me, those who I look up to. I love gleaning from their wisdom. I love when they talk, I listen. I don't adopt the attitude of, you know, man, look, I've got 1,500 books. I'm on the front lines of ministry in Philadelphia. When you are in the field on the front lines, you're just like, it's funny, someone came from California. We had visitors come from Santa Barbara. And when they met our Level Up teenagers, they were like, wow, you guys are only 15, 16. You look so much older than the people, we kids, we have the same age in the suburbs of Santa Barbara. Well, that's because Philadelphia does that. When you're a pastor in a city like Philadelphia, what you're exposed to on a daily basis, if you're on the front lines, does that. But yet and still, I don't ever, may the Lord protect me, I don't ever want to adopt the posture where I still can't look to want to listen to others and say, well, I got tons of books, tons of experience. I got the Holy Ghost. I got the word. I'm good now. I still want to have the posture of having mentors in my life that I can learn from. When they talk, I listen. I'm not trying to convince them how much I know. I'm willing to just be silent, even if my silence looks like I'm just a little baby sitting on a stool swinging his legs. Uh, I love still taking a humble position. What about you? Do you still love sitting and learning? 
Uh, do you have someone? Or when is the last time you've asked your pastor? Yo, how can I be growing? What can I be doing? Uh, any blind spots that you see in how I'm operating ministry? How can I be doing this better? When's the last time you've even asked that? Yo, who loves instruction, loves knowledge. But we all have to watch out for this pitfall because the heart's desperately wicked. But Proverbs 12, 1, he that hate, hates correction is stupid. Yo, Lord, that, I mean, that stings me. Because, yo, I could preach my heart out right now. And, bro, if I don't watch my heart in just a nanosecond, be stupid. Because somehow I don't like correction. Somehow someone corrects me and who do they think they are and blah, 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 blah. Yo, who loves instruction, loves knowledge. Do you thank people when they challenge you? You know what? Thank you for that. You know what? Thank you for that. See, Proverbs gets into that character stuff. Who loves instruction, loves knowledge. Yo, thank you for correcting me. You know what? Did I thank you for correcting me? Oh, I thanked you eight times. Thank you again for correcting me. Please remain that way in my life because we live in a day where everyone's just everyone's yes men. Friendship has been reduced to affirmation only and not aspiration. You see, when your friendships are based on affirmation and aspiration, it's people who affirm that you're the bomb, affirm that you're beautiful, affirm that you're awesome, but they also, because they want you to aspire, they also challenge you. See, today, friendships have been reduced to just affirmation only. Everyone's around just like, oh yeah, everything you say is great, every joke you say is funny, everything you drop is deep, all your excuses are valid. No, we want to be friends, and we want friends around us that actually are there for affirmation and aspiration, meaning they want to see us be the best we could be, and they will even challenge us. But yo, when they challenge us, we can't be stupid. When our parents challenge us, we can't be stupid. When your pastor challenges, you can't be stupid. We just can't be stupid. Yo, Lord, makes us just want to repent right now. Let me look at the ways I'm just stupid. Yo, Proverbs 12, 1, whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he that hates correction is stupid. Oh my gosh. Yo, that's deep. Yeah, the NIV, it says in the King James, brutish, and the NIV, it says stupid. By the way, if you want some good commentaries, uh, here's the NIV application commentary series. This one's on Proverbs. They have it on every book of the Bible. Also, John Phillips, uh, these are his uh, commentaries on Proverbs. I would recommend these two, actually. I have a lot of commentaries on Proverbs. Uh, three rows over in my library. I have some stuff by Ironside and Spurgeon um, and, 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 and McLaren and Wearsby. But these are probably the best two I've ever seen. Best two I've seen because they're practical. Let's keep it moving. A good man obtains favor from the Lord, verse two, but a man of wicked devices will be condemned. What does it mean a good man obtains favor of the Lord? Who's a good man? Well, we know there is none good and we're only good by receiving Christ as our Lord and Savior and receiving his righteousness. So, but what does it mean here when it says a good man obtains favor from the Lord? Because we want that favor. Of course we want favor from God. Of course we want to be that one like Jacob, where he says to Jacob when he's wrestling with him in Genesis 32, you have now, you've got power with God and with men. That's one of the most beautiful things I feel God has ever said to a person. And what's beautiful is he says it to like the biggest sinner, the biggest knucklehead in the Old Testament. But because that knucklehead surrendered, he said, through your surrender, you now have power with God and you have power with men. Genesis 32. How do we do live that kind of life? Power with God. Where people are like, yo, I'm praying, I'm going to talk to God. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you know the heart of God. Power with men. The peacemaker. When you come on the scene, the, the climate changes. You're not a thermometer. You're a thermostat. you got power with men. Your presence lowers statistics. That's how God, that's what salt and light is. You being around makes the situation better, makes spirits uplifted. How do we have power with God and power with men? How do we have that favor of the Lord? Proverbs 12, 2. It says here, a good man is one who plans to do good. When your intentions are to go out and bless, to go out and serve, you got the favor of God on you. 
You've got the favor of the Lord. When you're looking to just not just be another law abiding citizen that just goes to work, comes home uh, and, you know, let somebody in when they're trying to get in uh, and you're the 18th car and the first 17 didn't let them in. No, we're talking seeking to do good. Like the way Jesus got up in the morning. What did it look like when Jesus went out looking to do good? He had a job. He was a carpenter. He was a stonemason carpenter. But the Bible talks like next to nothing about what his J-O-B was, but it talks about what his acts of goodness were. That's how we obtain that favor of God. Let's be in ministry. Let's look to what we're going to do. That's why when we're encouraging people to get in ministry, we're not getting on your case. We're not blah, blah, blah. No, we are literally trying to plug you into normal Christian living. Normal Christian living. Here's what's deep in the book of Acts. Everyone had J-O-Bs. Everybody. Everyone would have had a LinkedIn profile. But what's Acts about? The Acts they did for Jesus. That's why the local church is so important. That's why it's so important to get plugged in. So you don't have to sit and think this thing on your own. The Lord developed a system, an economy, a flow chart of where you can just go get plugged in, where you can direct your resources, direct your funds, you pray for your leadership and you get plugged in. Your spiritual gifts get activated. Yo, we are really, really in danger of making a whole new version of Christianity. Jesus said in Luke 18, 8, when the son of man even returns, will he even find the faith on the earth? He doesn't mean, will I find Christianity? He's saying, will I find orthodox Christianity, normal Christianity? The whole theme of Proverbs 12 is character and outcomes, character and outcomes, character dictates outcomes. That's why it's all, every verse has a but in it. Look at this, who loves instruction, loves knowledge, but he that is stupid hates correction. A good man, verse two, obtains favor of the Lord, but a man of wicked devices he will condemn. A man will not be established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous will not be moved. A.W. Tozer wrote a book called The Root of the Righteous. This is where he got it from. He also had a book called The Knowledge of the Holy, because it says, uh, you know, the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Uh, sounds like A.W. Tozer spent a lot of time in Proverbs. He's got at least two books uh, named after verses in Proverbs. A virtuous woman, a virtuous wife is a crown to her husband, but she that makes her husband ashamed is like rottenness or like decay to his bones. The thoughts of the righteous are right. But the counsels of the wicked, the advice of the wicked, there's deceit all up in it. The words of the wicked are to lie and wait for blood. The words of the wicked is to get revenge. You know, do you. Uh, you know, it's all about, you know, self-preservation. But the mouth of the upright will deliver them. The wicked are overthrown and are not. I mean, look at how many people we see. Oh, man, mansion. They had the whole world. They just won all these awards and they committed suicide and they have all this money and they have all this yo you heard someone so's dead yo one minute it looks like the wicked run the world it looks like you can literally thumb your nose at god and literally have all your cake and eat it too but then boom you just hear like like psalm 73 they're in slippery places they're gone as in a moment yo but the house of the righteous will stand I just want to read a few other verses that have rocked me in Proverbs 12. When I say rocked me, rocked me. Proverbs 12, 16, a fool's wrath is known, but a prudent man covers shame. Uh, what it means is a fool shows his annoyance right away, but a prudent man overlooks an insult. <laughs> Yo, maybe you see yourself that way. You know someone they get annoyed so fast. I mean, faster than a speeding bullet. It says here, a fool's wrath is presently known. A fool gets annoyed at once, immediately off nothing. But a prudent man overlooks an insult. So again, in the King James, it says, a fool's wrath is presently known, but a prudent man covers shame. NIV says, a fool shows his annoyance right away, but a prudent man overlooks an insult. How are you with overlooking insults and offenses? 
Yeah, someone around, they said something real crazy, talked out their neck real sideways. But yo, someone's really acting a fool. But you wouldn't know it by looking at your face. Why? Because 1 Peter 4, 8, love covers a multitude of sins. You're not bringing it up, not because it wasn't ugly. You're not bringing it up, not because it wasn't toxic. You're not bringing it up, not because the devil didn't totally take control of that person at the moment. But yo, love covers a multitude of sins. My general rule, and I've not mastered this. I'm just another person trying to work at their own salvation and be like Jesus. But my general rule is this. I will let something slide. I will let something slide. I try to not come from a place of I'm offended. Though the scripture does say that you should share your offenses because you don't want to let the sun go down on your heart and you become bitter and that bitterness springs up. Because some people I go, oh yeah, I'm not letting, I'm, let, I'm turning the other cheek. I'm turning the other cheek. No, you're not. You're getting bitter as a mug, right? Bitter as all get out. I'm trying, a bitter as a mug, bitter as all get out. Bitter to the nth degree. Okay, how's that? Um, so look, there is the biblical protocol of if you're offended, you go to that person right away, Matthew 18, 15, because you want to protect your own heart and you want to really not give the enemy any room. But there's also a place for just overlooking an insult, you know, and that is a prudent man, wisdom. It's just like, you know what, for the bigger picture, for the bigger unity, you know what, that person didn't mean it. You know what I mean? And that, and that's what I really try to look at. If I feel like because Jesus said it's impossible, but that sinners get together and people don't just start stepping on each other's toes. If it was a mistake, if, if the person was just socially awkward and they just kind of chopped at the pastor, people do that, right? You know, they're socially awkward. So they say the d dumbest and even just some things that are just weird, right? I try to really think about, okay, what's going on here? If it was just something like that and blah, 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 a little too much fun, yo, let love cover it. But if you feel that it's a malicious thing and you, for the person, for the sake of their own heart, that that's actually going to hurt them having that position in their heart. It's going to block their devotional life. It's going to block their growth in the Lord. You know what? For Now I, I feel like I do need to say something. But yo, we should always want to just be able to look over an insult. Verse 18 of Proverbs 12. There's he that speaks like the piercings of a sword. Um, it says in the NIV, reckless words pierce like a sword. Makes us want to really think about our words. Reckless, reckless, yo, reckless words pierce like a sword, right? Right? They say 60 stones might break my bones, right? But words will never hurt me. You know, words hurt. Words could hurt worse than a beatdown. Because a beatdown will heal. Words could go in and cut. Uh, and that's there. That's why even, you know, with youth and different people, I try to even... Teach what I wish I learned in the hood growing up a little sooner, but uh, I still remember nasty things said to me growing up in the hood, even in the name of fun, but it was reckless. I still remember things I said to other people, right? Um, I try to so work with our level up youth and just watching the words that they say to one another because, yo, it looks all fun and games, but you're cutting each other. But look, it's not just level up youth. Yo, mature Christians do that, right? Reckless words pierce like a sword. But the tongue of the wise brings healing, Proverbs 12, 18. We need to have that tongue that brings health. When we speak health to people, we should really look at our words. You could be in all the Bible, quote Bible, no Bible, have beautiful notebooks, beautiful highlighters, beautiful marker collection, beautiful commentaries, but your words cut people. And how is a good way to know if your words cut people? Well, has someone told you lately that your words cut? Has someone told you lately that your words can cut? And there it is right there. We really, because again, it goes back, who loves instruction, loves knowledge, but he that hates correction is stupid. Verse one, verse 18, there's he that speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings health. We really want to have tongues that bring health. Hebrews 3.13 says that we need to be provoking one another to pursue Jesus. How, what's the ultimate way for your tongue to bring health? To speak to someone. Hey, yo, are you looking at Daily Bread drive through Yo, our pastor is preaching his heart out, or at least trying to, every day at noon. Not for his Daily Bread, because he's already studying up until 12. No, 12 is when he actually is teaching, right, for the love of the body. Yo, are you are you tuning in? Yo, that's your that's that's bringing health to people. 
like, yo, you could do it, man. You know, do it on the ride home. Like, you know, get in that rhythm. You know how easy it is to make bad habits. You know, if we can make time for other things, we got to make time for the word. Think of just how much you'll learn more of the word. When else will you be in the book of Proverbs? That actually is your tongue now speaking health. It's more than just affirmation. It doesn't say, oh, the tongue of the wise does just likes on, on, on Facebook, likes on Instagram, fire emojis. Ooh, you're a beast. Ooh, fire emoji. Ooh, uh, flex arm emoji. Ooh, you're all that. No, no, no. That's not being health. That's just affirmation culture that everyone does. And a lot of it's fake, right? Not saying, I'm not calling nobody fake, but it's, 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 it's superficial. It's, it's only yay deep. Yo, we really want to have a tongue that brings health where we're saying exactly, right, what the person needs. Yo, verse 27 of Proverbs 12, and then I'm out of your way. Don't log off now. Are they logging off, Jonah? Because this one is the one. Jonah, tell them not to log off. off. Yes, he's homesick. We don't play hooky here. No, he doesn't have COVID. (laughs) He's all right, but he's felt a little under the weather. Tell him again not to log off, son. Are we having a good time? Yo. Verse 27, this one is the one that got me excited. Verse one really challenged me. Verse two really got me excited about obtaining the favor of the Lord. But verse 27, verse 27 is that one. Are you ready? Yo, praise God for his word. Are you ready? Do you kiss your Bible? Let's go, right? This is the thoughts of his heart. It says in Psalm 33. To kiss, to adore your Bible is to adore the thoughts of his heart. To adore the thoughts of his heart is to adore his heart. To adore his heart is to adore adore him. Do you love your Bible? Ready? Let's read this proverb. And I'm going to tell you again, I went through seven different worldviews, seven different religions before coming to Christ. I have never been talked to the way God's word talks to me. And I'm so glad that my head, I'm, I'm a knucklehead like anyone else. I could become a Pharisee faster than anyone else. But I'm so excited that by reading his word, it still gets me excited. That's just his goodness. But again, verse two, a good man obtains favor from the Lord. Yo, because I want to minister his word, that means if verse two is real, look, I either believe it or I don't. Yo, if I want to teach his word, that's going to give me favor. Yo, you go get excited. Now, who can you teach the word to? Who can you go break it down to? Go get your, go feel the favor of God on you when you share the word. But boom, I got to do verse 27, then we're out of here, okay? Yo, Jonah, my son, my star, my man, right? It's National Sunday, right? But we're not posting no pics. Every day is National Sunday for you, right? Yo, it says in verse 27, the lazy man doesn't roast what he caught hunting. A lot of people say, well, what does this mean? Because here's the thing. Roasteth in the King James, it's the only time in the whole Bible that verb is used. The common and the most traditional rabbinic uh, interpretation of this is a lazy person will go catch a fish. He don't finish the job. Catch the fish. You know what it's like? You go to the grocery store, you buy meat, okay? And then you just go home and watch TV, order food, and then go to the meat in the fridge, and you ain't you ain't finished the job. You brought the meat home, you ain't cook it. Oh, it's expired. You gotta throw it away. The lazy man will go out and fish, catch the fish, put it on ice, bring it home, but will not finish the job of scaling it, gutting it, cleaning it, and cooking it. The lazy man will go hunt and won't come home and cook it. Yo, when you open that Bible, okay, you've got the meat in front of you, but are you going to finish the job and roast it and really eat it? Or are you just doing a little reading, little reading, little highlighting, little notes? Oh, I didn't know. No, no, no. Are you going to sit there and roast it? The lazy man will go hunt. He will, he will actually catch something. It don't say he goes and sits in the deer tree up in the tree, uh, the deer uh, stand up in the tree, falls asleep. No, he actually goes out, finishes it, hunts, gets the meat, takes the meat home, but he don't finish the job. The lazy man runs 90 yards and then drops the football and don't finish the last 10. That bring, that's a whole new way of looking at laziness. Because, you know, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed person's king, yo, you can... 
just going to church in this day makes it look like you on fire for the Lord. In the book of Acts, though, that was just considered like as normal as uh, getting out of bed, right? Yo, you can be doing what seems so right, but the Lord look and see it as lazy because we don't finish the job. Okay, so you're in ministry at the church. You show up to do the ministry, but you don't do the ministry to the end and follow through. No, it's like hunting, catching the animal, and you did everything except for cook the meat. Yo, let's meditate on really what it means to be diligent. It says here in Proverbs 12, 27, the substance of a diligent man is precious. Yo, this was convicting today. It was, but it comes back to this. Whoever loves instruction, loves knowledge. The person that loves the knowledge of God loves correction. Wow. Yo, let's be back tomorrow. Like and share. Let's go deep. Let's get right. Let's represent. Let's love his word. Let's roast that food. Yo, what do you do now? You done come out today. You you went hunting. You tuned in the daily bread. You went hunting. We got Proverbs 12. Now what you going how you going to roast that Proverbs 12 now? Who are you going to pass it on to? What's the conversation going to be over dinner tonight? What's the conversation going to be with the loved ones? What about those, you know, that you know used to watch the teaching of the word and now they're not? What you going to do? You going to roast that food now? You going to finish it out? Yo, let's all do our part. May God's spirit help us and grace us. Salute. God bless you.